Spread the fire, feed the mind. Welcome to SMWX. Today we're going to have a conversation about elections and democracy, particularly in Africa. And that's an important conversation because this year is a big year for democracy in Africa. Na, 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 na. Just to put it in perspective, they were meant to be 19 elections throughout the continent. 19. Let me run you through some of the numbers so that you have a perspective of what was meant to go down. And I'll tell you why I say meant to as opposed go as opposed to go into. Right. So Mali has a presidential election that was penned for the 4th of February. Senegal has a presidential election pegged for the 25th of February. South Africa has a presidential election. So not a presidential election, a parliamentary election, which was meant to a national election, which was meant to happen or is meant to happen between May and August. There's a billionaire who has posted content and said that the day is 22 May. So we'll have to see if that billionaire got a tip off from the right sources or not. But there are two theories, fundamentally, that there may be a May election or an August election. I think there'll be a May election. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Mauritania is supposed to have a presidential election uh, in June. Uh, Burkina Faso is supposed to have a presidential election in July. Rwanda is supposed to have a presidential and legislative election on the 15th of July. Mozambique is supposed to have a presidential and legislative election in October. Botswana is supposed to have a general election in October. Chad is supposed to have a presidential and legislative election in October. Somaliland presidential election in November. Tunisia, presidential election in November. Mauritius, general election, November. Namibia, presidential election, November. Ghana, presidential and legislative election in December. Algeria, presidential election in December. Guinea-Bissau, presidential election in December. Guinea, presidential and legislative election in December. South Sudan, presidential and legislative election in December. That's a lot of elections. That's 19 in total. But to already cut it down, there are two elections that have been postponed, number one being Mali and number two being Burkina Faso. Why have these elections been postponed? Mali and Burkina Faso recently went through coups, and those coups were orchestrated by military hunters, and the military hunters took over. And those military hunters have basically been promising the African Union and ECOWAS, which is the, the community of the West African states, that we are going to have elections in 2024. But they all indicated, this is uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, that there's not going to be elections this year. It's not a priority for them. They are stabilizing. They are you know, making sure that the security in the country. So fundamentally, when it comes to Mali and when it comes to Burkina Faso, no elections. I want to pause after having given you this list of elections and discuss the first issue that's really on the table, and that is the credibility of democracy. In the continent of Africa, the youth of Africa have been saying more and more that they don't buy into democracy as a model. And what drives the skepticism of democracy overall is a variety of things. The first thing is that the youth are looking at the corruption of their governments, they're looking at the corruption of their politicians, and they're looking at democracy as something that is not doing anything for them. And can you blame them? The median age on the continent of Africa is 19, but the median age of African politicians, especially those in national leadership, is 60. There is a 41-year gap between the leaders and the youth, and there is a big gap in terms of lifestyle opportunity between the youth of Africa, who are the majority of the African population, and the leaders of Africa. So young people, understandably, are no longer as interested in the mechanics of democracy as you would anticipate they should be. Number two, they've seen a lot of wasted opportunities in terms of democracy. Young people have sometimes come out in big numbers in support of 
opposition leaders and a moment of transition, a moment of change, only to be burnt by corrupt electoral processes. If you recall, in Uganda, Bobby Wine had a wave. He was running for president of Uganda. The youth of uh, Uganda were behind him. Then, you know, the government of Yoweri Museveni cracked down heavily with the heavy fist, military brutality, limited access to the media. At some point, Bobby Wine was under house arrest. And there was also a lot of rigging of the election itself. As a result of that, can you blame the youth of Uganda from actually looking at everything and saying, what's the point? What's the point in my sacrificing my life, my time, my body, my limited resources, participating in this democratic system when the old man in charge is just going to steal the election howsoever he feels like, right? If you look at Zimbabwe as another example, multiple opportunities, young people, and some of them are no longer young because when they were young, they tried this. You know, in 2002, young people came out, they supported the movement for democratic change. They were burnt. They were violently assaulted by the state. And ultimately, their efforts came to nothing. They tried that again in 2008. Some young people tried that again in 2023. And the outcomes of youth involvement in elections in Zimbabwe has simply led to disappointment after disappointment, after disappointment. So young people are realistically looking at this whole thing and saying, what is really the point? What is the point of this democracy? If there's electoral corruption, if the older people who are representing me are also not interested in my life, in anything that is happening to me, why should I participate in this particular thing? Finally, I think it's also the fact that no matter what happens in some countries, you have the same party which continues to be the ruling party year after year after year after year. This is what is known in political science as a dominant party. A dominant party is a party that has been governing a particular country for multiple elections without any real challenge. And in Africa, there are many dominant party states where one party basically has a monopoly. And what that does is that it undermines the fundamental framework of democracy. Democracy is a system of govern governance where those who govern do so with the consent of the majority. The system is supposed to have checks and balances. The checks and balances are such that if those who govern steal, if they mislead, if they mismanage, if they misappropriate any of those things, at the next election, there is a mechanism called the vote which allows those people to be removed. But when you have politicians who can sit back relax and tell you, we are going to rule until Jesus comes back. You must deal. That says something to somebody who's young looking at this saying, people have been waiting for Jesus to come back for over 2000 years. So if these guys are so adamant that they're going to wait for, they're going to rule until Jesus comes back, why would I waste my limited time on earth? Life expectancy in many African countries is around about 65. Why would you waste your life trying to fix a problem? that has defied decades and generations before you. And in many African countries, we must remember South Africa, where a lot of the audience who's watching this is, is a relatively young uh, democratic nation coming in at 30 years this year. Some countries in Africa have been free since 1960, right? Making them 64. So it means that someone's grandfather died trying to get democracy. Someone's grandfather, grandmother, malume, mama, ke, baba, ke, basho ni le bonke, waiting for democracy. So now imagine you're a 22 year old and a politician in Africa comes and says to you, hey, there's an election happening on the 15th of July in Rwanda. Go and vote and change the nation. You're going to be like, come on, man. What are we doing here? I've got problems to solve in my life. I've got bread to put on the table for my family. I've got bills chasing me. Why would I bother with this particular thing? So there's a lot of despondency among young people. And also, that gerontocracy, by the way, that's the, the, the technical term for old people who are in government. It's called gerontocracy. It's a government of the elders uh, in, a, in a national society. That gerontocracy is not unique to Africa. 
but it's been such a feature in Africa for a very long time. If you look at the American elections at the time of us having this conversation, Donald Trump has won two primaries, one in Ohio and one in, in New Hampshire. He's likely to become the nominee for the Republican Party. And on the Democratic side, Joe Biden is basically um, coming in uncontested. He's kind of contested, but not really. So there are two nominees, both of whom are over 70, running to be the president of the United States of America. And many people in America are saying, listen, these two guys, we wish we didn't have them as an option. They are a little bit on the older side. We don't know if they are still fully um, prepared for all of the challenges that come with the rigors of this kind of a job. So the gerontocracy problem is not unique to African states, but it's one that is particularly frustrating in African states where the median age of the continent is 19. So I thought it was important for us to explore that in and of itself as a discussion point to say, as you're watching this, do you care about election? Are you going to vote? I think there's one or two countries where your vote really does make a difference. One of them is in South Africa. I think that the South African election is one of the elections wherein there still is free media. There still is... Uh, freedom of movement of political parties, EFF, Action SA, you name it. They can have their manifesto events. They can do whatever they feel like doing to get votes. And largely, that will be unimpugned. In other African countries, that's not the case. So I want to just like discuss loosely some of the upcoming elections to show you where the challenges are really going to lie. Thanks for watching SMWX. Before we get back to the episode, I just wanted to let you know the four ways that you can help support this channel if you want to see us growing bigger and better to keep you more entertained and informed. The first way is you can invite me to speak at your company, your school, your institution. You'll see the contact details down below. The second way is that you can become a member of this channel. Become a member or you can give us a thanks. You'll see there's like a heart with a dollar sign in the ribbon below this video. Buy me and the team some coffee for this episode. The third way you can get involved is you can advertise on the channel. Now, I'd much rather the community of viewers would be advertisers on this channel than me going out to people who don't really know about SMWX and trying to explain it to them. So if you're a viewer and you have a business and you want to partner and you love this platform, let's partner on this channel. And then finally, you can buy merchandise, you can buy books. All this is in the description down below. Now let's get back to the episode. Paul Kagame has been running Rwanda for a very long time. And in the last election, he won the election with 99% of the votes. All of his challengers have been disqualified one way or another from running from the race. So if you think about Rwanda versus South Africa, South Africa has a real election. Rwanda has a coronation process where we basically all call it a democracy, but it's not a democracy, that thing. And I'm going to say that, I say with my 10 toes, I stand on business. There's no democracy in Rwanda. So I think that in other spaces, other territories, there is a lot that is still on the stake. And I think that South Africa is one of those. Another country where democracy, I think, is still vibrant, Botswana, another one is in Namibia. But these other country, these countries also have their own challenges. So we've discussed a little bit Rwanda. SADC is having a lot of elections. Just look at the SADC countries, Mozambique, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa. That's a lot of countries having elections at the same time, neighboring each other. And they all have a bearing on the future of the region. One of the, th one of the reasons I say this is because we oftentimes underestimate what happens when democracy fails in a nation. And as much as there's skepticism about democracy, I do think that it's the best system of government. It's just unfortunate that we no longer have real democracies in a lot of African countries. So let's use Mozambique as an example. Mozambique is having the election later this year, as I said, in October. The challenge is, in Mozambique, one party has been running the situation for a very long time, and that's Frelimo. Frelimo has been the government of Mozambique for a very long time, and they have been mismanaging the country. As a result of that, many people from Mozambique have left Mozambique and they found their way into South Africa. What does that do? One, it creates a brain drain for Mozambique because many of their highly talented and qualified people just get their passports and bounce. 
But on the other side, it's also created social tensions because those who don't have high skills but still feel like they don't have opportunities in Mozambique will still go to South Africa and become part of that informal economy of undocumented immigrants. And that, as we know, has created lots of social tensions. And the same applies to Zimbabwe, which had the election last year. But because of all of the atrocities that have happened over the years, many people have left Zimbabwe. Some of them have found their way into South Africa. And we also know that that has created social tensions. So when you have failing democracies or failing nations around you, the nation which is kind of like still moving forward or still has some of its ducks in a row is going to have to absorb the failures of the other regional partners. And that's an issue, right? If we had a situation where we had vibrant, inclusive democracy in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, how much further would the SADC region be? How much further would the SADC region be if everyone had a GDP per capita of over $5,000? Hmm? How, how much further would we be? But right now, we've got a situation where we've got Mozambique going through challenges, we've got Zimbabwe going through challenges because of the failures of democracy, because of these dominant party states, which basically are run by corrupt people who rig elections and all of that stuff. That has an impact on the status of democracy in those particular countries. So another election that's worth watching, right, is the election in Botswana. People are saying that this could be one of the elections which could be a toss-up. Right now, the president is, is Masisi, and he seems to be going in for a comfortable second term. But there are so many dynamics in uh, the Botswana situation which create, you know, room for um, an emergent outcome, so or a divergent outcome, or a disruptive outcome, rather. So one of those is that the former president, Ian Kama, has got beef with the current president, Masisi. And he's living in South Africa right now. He's facing charges of uh, illegal use of weapons, and he does not support the current administration. And as well, the opposition has been able to come together and form an umbrella of sorts. And what that has done is that it has created space for there to be perhaps a change of government. But having said all of that, we must note that Botswana has been led by the same party since its independence. So it is the classic example of a dominant party state. To the defense, or to be fair to the Botswana government, many people use Botswana as an example of good governance and good administration. But there are issues that are affecting the youth, unemployment being one of them, low opportunities for economic growth and that's one of the things that is uh, is making the race competitive. In Namibia, the current president has finished his his second term or is finishing his second term. And now the party is going into a period where we'll have to see whether or not the, the deputy president of the party and the government can actually be competitive under his own name. And that remains to be seen. So Namibia is going to be an interesting race. Ghana later on in the year, has got also interesting prospects, which we will cover as we get closer to the time, because there they've actually had an exchange of government a few times. And that has been very effective, because what that's done is that it's shown that nobody is guaranteed power. Nobody is guaranteed administration. Many of the African countries that I've spoken about are facing similar challenges. What are those challenges? High youth unemployment high inflation, high costs of living, low levels of security in certain parts of the country. And all of those things are affecting most significantly the poorest of the poor. And a lot of these countries are still dealing with high levels of poverty as well. So you could, you could just pick any of these countries and the problems that affect the youth in terms of access to services in, uh, in the rural areas are the same access to internet, access to electricity, they're the same. There, there are no real um, discrepancies here in terms of what other issues are. Africa is not one country, but when you sometimes look at the problems that are facing the various African countries, it's more or less the same. It's more or less the same. And that's the problem that we're facing in Africa. Now, 
I want to talk about the potential a little bit about the continent for you to think about. I want you to think about this. In 2050, the population of Africa is projected to be 2.5 billion. 2.5 billion. Up from 1.4 billion where we are now. So Africa is projected to become the largest app, uh, market in the world. That's something that is known as a demographic dividend, right? Demographic dividend. Why is a demographic dividend significant? A demographic dividend gives you the kind of advantage that China had because everyone now wants to sell to your people because you have the most people. But in order to exploit a demographic dividend, you need to make sure that your people are adequately equipped to take advantage of being the largest market, which is how China was able to become now, you know, a rival power to America. Why am I mentioning this? If we had functional democracies in the continent, because 2050 sounds like it's a long way off, but if you're 20 years old now, it's 26 years away. So you'll be 46 by that time. You'll have two kids, a daughter who's 14, and maybe a, a son who's 16 who'll say to you, Papa, you know, why am I not making progress in life? All right? And then you can't say, ah. you know, they will ask you your version of what did you do in the struggle. So it seems like it's far away, but it's not so far away. So I'm mentioning this because what would happen if we really had functional states solving these problems of access to education, access to opportunity, um, cost of living crisis, housing crisis, Africa could really take off. Africa has shown potential. If you look at the Afrobeats community, you look at some of the stuff that happens in fashion and film, you can see that young Africans are really brilliant and ready to go. But when you look at other sectors which require support, which require infrastructure, which require an enabling environment, you often see that um, Africa starts falling back, especially the young people who are trying to make uh, away in those spaces. So democracy in Africa has to be watched. It has to be promoted. There has now been this attraction to these cool leaders, the guys who have been doing all the coups. But the attraction comes from the fact that for so long, many of these countries have just been failing as democracies. They've just been failing. So many people are now beginning to look at coups and strong men as the answer. But I don't really think that that is the answer. In your own estimation, now I'm putting it to you because we're going to have a conversation in the comments. In your own estimation, are you living in one of these countries which have an election this year? Are you going to vote? What do you feel about democracy? Is it working for you? If it's not working for you, what do you feel about it? If it is working for you and you're voting, who, who, who's your guy or girl or they? Who are you picking? And why? Let's let's tell us. Put it in the thing there. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like so that this thing goes up on the tingalings, right? And they bring me back again. So let's have a conversation. I'm really curious to hear what you have to think in this big year of de there's Afcon, but then there's DEFCON, Democracy Con. It's happening. DECCON, not DEFCON, that's a different thing. DECCON, it's happening in Africa, 19 countries. Which one? is your team and what are you supporting it for? Let's have a conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah.